hello and a warm welcome also from my side. With me is also Silvia Buckers. Um, I'm Andreas Franz. We are both product managers for the as a submarketing cloud. And today we will give you an input on how you can use interest-based targeting to maximize your marketing impact. Of course, we have this classical disclaimer. I guess you know it all. So what are we going to show you today? First of all, we would like to give you a short introduction on the current situation, why we believe that interest-based targeting is important. And then we prepared a small business scenario, which will guide us through the whole process or the whole presentation a little bit to give us examples. And we will also show you the feature set of SMC in that area. And then based off on our customer experience, um, we also prepared some best practices for you, uh, which can guide you to how you get started with using interest and also interest-based targeting. And of course, we will also have a slot for answering your questions. And also if, if there are too many questions, we will also then answer them in a written form. So let's see how much time we will have left. So let's start and look a bit into the situation we are currently in. So we, when I say we, then mainly it's, would say the market, and this is especially relevant for the B2C market. We have been converted into some kind of experience economy. So the customers expect and buying experience when they shop online, but not only only online, but also in the physical store. It is about experience, which should be relevant for them. And I guess you all know that you get an email which has nothing to do with what what you have interest in or what you want to see. Then it's not really relevant, and you probably put it in the, into the spam folder or just delete it. Uh, so it should be relevant, personalized, and also convenient and easy to consume. And we see that. Roughly 70% of purchases are based on how an experience feels. So in the end, that means a good customer experience drives revenue or has the potential to drive revenue, whereas a bad experience has a high potential that uh, you will lose revenue and also lower your uh, customer satisfaction. And then we see that 80% of the CEOs believe they deliver a superior experience. And guess what? And you probably know it. Only 8% of the customers agree. So this is, overall, this is an issue for the companies. And then in the recent years, uh, too bad that we can already say years, but we see that also the pandemic enforced new customer behaviors. So uh, by by Today, of course, it changed a little bit, but in the highest uh, lockdown uh, situations, we had like 2.6 billion people basically locked down um, at home to to a more or less uh, extreme extent. And um, we had lots of business locations and also physical stores closed. Um, of course, these restrictions are getting lifted as now COVID is a bit decreasing and and probably also people that get a bit tired on all the restrictions. But in the end, what still persists is that 40% of those people won't shop in malls for at least a certain time frame. So this is really then intensifies this experience problem. And we believe that one of the main drivers of experience is good engagement. Um, so customers, have this demand uh, to, to have a good and personalized engagement. And in the end, to provide such an engagement, you need to understand your customer. And especially in Europe, you need to do that without being too intrusive. And you need to do it legally compliant. Um, and this is why we set up this, this webcast today to give you an insight uh, how we SMC can also support you to do so. And as a clear statement, and I, I found this quote um, on Seth Godin's blog, he's running a 
blog uh, about marketing and also has published several books. And I liked it a lot because this really summarizes it in just four words. Everyone is not your customer. Um, so, and, and this, I believe, has changed a lot in the recent years that a former time is marketing was often about sending out as many emails as possible or something like that. We are now converting it into a better experience. And then really is the case. That everyone is not the customer. You really need to look on whom you want to target. And for that, there are some criterias. And most of the time, it's, it depends a, bit, a little bit in what kind of literature you look in. But those can be grouped in, in four main criterias. There's this behavioral criteria, which is about number of visits, device used, and the whole journey the customer has. We have geographic criteria, like weather, location, but also day, time. It could also be the question, is, is it winter or is it summer? Things like that. We have demographic criteria, which is quite often pretty similar to master data. It's gender, age, it's profession, income, things like that. And we have this which are called here psychographic criteria. So this is about the personality, what kind of person is this customer, and also about interest and lifestyle. And often personality and, and interest and lifestyle are connected. And basically those two are in the focus of this webcast. Um, this is a relatively complex topic, I would say. So of course we cannot cover everything in one hour, but we hope that we can give you some ideas and then probably something as a takeaway for you as a customer, also in your customer projects, depending on your role you're in. So then let, let us have a look in the business case. Um, this is a, in, in the end it's a demo case, but perhaps you can find some of those things also in, in your experience, we have a company which is called Galodoro. This is a multi-brand company and has a focus on production and trade of fine food. And these uh, products are sold in many channels and they have also a, a direct to consumer online store. And they also have a wholesale distribution for, for B2B customers. And um, they are set up in, in three business units one is for coffee and fine food. So that's about coffee production and also trade of coffee and fine food in an uh, e-commerce shop. And they have, a, let's say, a shop or a business unit which is linked to that. This is about specified household electronics. So this is mainly about trading of pizza ovens and espresso machines, coffee milling machines. Uh, so everything you need. Um, to take care of your fine food basically. But this is run as a separate business unit, also in a, in a separate uh, dedicated online store. And then they have this whole B2B business, which is about really distribution and, and wholesale. So everything they sell on the direct to consumer uh, channel, they basically also sell via B2B for restaurants, for company customers and things like that. But of course the business units, they act and behave a little bit different. So this is the starting point for what I'm going to show you. And in the next few slides, we are going to look on the capabilities of SMC in that areas. And I will try to give you an example of what that means. And then later on, we try to make it a bit more specific. Um, let's have a look on the definition um, of interest. I know definitions are probably not so popular, but I believe in this case, it makes sense to, to understand what, what we mean if we talk about interest. So an interest represents the content or subject of an interaction with a contact. And it also serves as a common abstraction, which can be linked to other business objects like products or events. So what, I guess what is important here is that it is linked to an interaction and that is also some kind of abstraction. Um, this would be my key takeaways for, for this definition. Um, and we will come to that later when we discuss how to set it up. Um, so to give you a short overview, and perhaps some of you know that um, 
graphical representation from, from our um, application help. Um, this is basically what we talk about today. So we talk about how we set all this interspace targeting up, what we need to do, and how we can make use of it also in segmentation. What is today not so much in focus is how we then really make, analyze and run campaigns based of it. So we really look mainly on, on the data management part and also on, on how we can use it in segmentation. Um, so perhaps we will have a follow-up webcast, but that's to be discussed. So now really looking into the feature set. Um, we have this um, central app called Maintain Interest. And this is an app which can be used for maintaining interest and also the mapping of interests. Important to know here is that this is, of course, you can also translate your interests, but um, apart from the really master data maintenance you can do here, you can also have mappings maintained. That means whenever a product category um, is sent to our system, the system is able to derive an interest from it and same also for tags or for events. So you don't need to care too much to get your inbound data really settled completely. It's often so sufficient to, to maintain a mapping. And this mapping can also be maintained after you load the data. So there's some post-processing in place. For our example, that could mean that you, of course, could have an interest, a very simple one like coffee, but, and this is probably also something as a, to, to get you thinking a little bit, um, it could also be a bit in a more orthogonal way, like a cross topic. So instead of having coffee, you could also think about having an interest regarding sustainability of fair trade, which are not really things directly linked to a product, but more um, topics which may be relevant for the customers buying coffee. And then the main thing you need to tackle is always getting the inbound data because it's fine if you maintain an interest in the platform, but um, you also need to make sure to get the data in. And of course, if you have a custom integration, you can always do it using our APIs. But in some areas we have features available. And one of these areas is the landing page. Um, depending on the customer and, 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 and the business case, landing page can be quite important. And in the landing page is fairly simple to also add an interest to, to um, an interaction being written and you can really directly collect this data from the customer. And, uh, and, and as an example here for, for Galodoro, it could be um, that you offer this sustainability report to the customer and then the customer ticks it off and he will get an email with this report and then in parallel, you would also enhance the customer profile with, with this interest of sustainability. Then we have another important data source. This is Google Analytics. Um, I guess all of you know Google Analytics. It's the web tracking solution from Google. And we have an integration which allows you to fetch data um, either from Google Analytics or also from Google 360. And this is also working really from the, uh, from the anonymous contact to the known contact. So there are means in place where you can really have that full end-to-end -end process. And you can also use tags within the mapping um, to tag the interactions and then from these tags you can derive interest. And again, if you look in that digital scenario, it's, for example, we could think that you have a website which is uh, explaining your corporate social responsibility or again, a website about sustainability. And then you uh, track that with Google Analytics and at the later stage, um, you link that data also with a known contact. And then you would be able to get the interest data indirectly via Google Analytics as well. And then this is rather, uh, now on top of it, I've written inbound data and, and in 
of course, this is some kind of a mixture. Um, in emails, you can configure it in a way that you can collect interest data from click-throughs. So you can either do that directly on the hyperlink where you can add an interest. Or also when you have a product block or a product recommendation, when clicking on that product, um, interest can also be derived so that the profile will automatically fetch fetch the interest based on that product or product category into the customer profile. Um, yes, and then I guess for most of the customer, this is especially for the e-commerce customers, this is the most important part. It's the commerce integration. And traditionally, I would say most of the data is also fetched from that integration. Because in commerce, we basically support the full customer journey. So that means really from having the initial visit on the commerce, commerce store to add, adding a item to the cart or removing it from the cart, shopping cart abandonments and, and all that information you can collect when someone is interacting with the store. All that data is coming into that integration. And also important, product master data is coming in. And this product master data can later be used to also maintain those mappings. So whenever you have a, for example, a product category view or a product view on your store or even a sales order, and a sales order can of course also consist of multiple products, you can derive an interest out of it. And I believe this is also where we see that strength of this interest concept here, because if you have a um, uh, e-commerce shop and have a sales order with whatever 10 products, doing segmentation on product SKU level is pretty complex task, especially as the product lines may be replaced during the year, during the year depending on, on what business you're running. If you have seasonal business, then this may be re really tricky because you get new product SKUs all the time and it's then really hard to maintain. But if you then are able to have the subtraction of the interest, you can keep it pretty stable and also more understandable for the marketeer in this case. And of course, as an example here, could be uh, that you um, also make some kind of cross usage of the data. So for Galodoro, that could mean if Galodoro knows that someone is buying coffee all the time, and probably is buying expensive coffee all the time, then it could also make sense to send them a newsletter for the espresso machines, for example, or the other way around. Of course, depending on, on that, uh, let's say, legal framework this company has in place. And then this is then really the interest level. So we are calculating out of all the data and interest level on the fly. Um, that's really a real time, kind of a real time score. And this interest level is available in the contact profile. And you can also really slice and dice in the contact profile. And it's also available in the segmentation. Um, we can make sure that you only use data of your specific marketing area for that. So that if you have a multi-brand company, you can really just work on the data, which you also allow to work on. And for one of the yeah, examples could be that you want to select contacts uh, showing the highest interest in a specific topic, for example, in sustainability in the last three months. And then you could also mix it up, up with other criteria like revenue or something of this context. And one thing, and then this is something I brought in here, and this, it's not directly related to to the interest or, or interest level, but I, I believe it's quite powerful if if you have a more complex segmentation in place. Those are the segmentation billing blocks. I bet some of you know it, but I hope some of you don't know it because then it's something you can 
have as a takeaway. But these building blocks, they allow you to really predefine certain kind of, let's say, segmentation elements, which then can easily be reused and can also be referenced. So then you can also centrally maintain those segmentation blocks. And if you then decide that you would um, have want to have a different interpretation for something, so for example, you have a block which you have defined as being your sustainability audience, and you change this block and this is a reference block, then all the uh, segmentation models where this block was used will change. And this is quite powerful, especially for larger companies. And this could potentially be used to also set up some kind of RFM approach. So you could have a block for recency, one for frequency and one for monetary value. And then you could also combine it with an interest level, for example. So just as as a starting point and to get you thinking a little bit. So this is really now what was probably a bit more the boring part because it is really on the features, but I guess it's important to understand what, what these features are about. And now let's have a look on, on the best practices. And this is really based on the experiences we have with our customers um, and trying to give you a bit of, of hints and tips on how you could set something up. So these are multiple steps. So the first step would be on how to define your interest. In the end, the interest, you would start with having, an, let's say, an identification and analyzation phase. This is basically where you look on your marketing and then understand what is driving, driving your marketing, what are the, probably the forces that are driving yours to success, do you have any specifics, like for example, events? So in our case for Galodoro, that could be coffee tasting events, um, which are relevant um, for, for marketing um, or special initiatives, like what I you know, mention so often, this whole sustainability thing, for example. Then there would be the idea that you, of course, it's always fine to brainstorm on, on dimensions, but you also should understand and select the right ones. And for that, it makes sense to to go into segmentation and also into analytics to really get a feeling what dimensions really drive success and what make a difference. And this is then, from my perspective, is really highly dependent on what conversion target you are aiming for. So. Ultimately, it's it's all about revenue. We know that, but there may be also conversion targets in between, like targets to gather data from customers, or probably a, a target where you differentiate between a classical sales order and a service order, where you wanna apply um, different dimensions also for your targeting. And this is something you could potentially think of. And in the last step, and this is really something we see quite often is happening is that the customer thinks a lot and makes a lot of concept and then uh, it's forgotten to have a process for reviewing everything. So basically this is like this classical management cycle where you can see um, what is happening and you are fine tune and adjust. Um, there may be adjustments you make because things are not working as expected, or you you also just need new dimensions, especially, for example, you have new product lines, then you can introduce it. Um, but I believe it's important to have this as a defined process because um, this interest definition is similar to having a marketing taxonomy. And I believe taxonomy maintenance is something that should not be just done on the fly that needs to have some uh, process and, and also probably some compliance behind because that really also impacts how you measure things and how you work. Then we have some do's and don'ts, or in this case, it's even don'ts and do's, which are pretty basic, but I just want to mention them. So don't and we really have seen that. So don't just copy your product categories. Because I believe if you just copy 
product categories, you won't get any value out of the interest. This just makes it even harder to maintain. Um, you cannot expect that a marketeer knows all the product categories, at least most of the time, and you just will create a huge volume of interest. Then, of course, it makes sense to to have a concept. So please don't start without a concept and without making a pre-analysis. And in that concept work, marketeers should be involved. So I don't have a full view on the attendees of, of this webcast, but um, I know that IT projects sometimes have the tendency to to forget um, the people which really should use that part of the software. And especially in this very business centric questions, it makes absolute sense to really involve marketeers and run workshops with them, probably also discuss this concept with them and then get out and define a concept and and, uh, and how you want to work with them. And then there are some do's, which you can easily convert to don'ts, but we want to stay positive here. So limit it to a certain number. We would say roughly 100 interest. Of course, it depends on company size and how many brands you're running. But 100 is something you which can be tackled. Um, keep it stable. So most of the time, if you set up such a concept, the interest will be become relevant for reporting. And if this is then changing constantly, then you just have a moving target also in reporting. So it's important to have it stable. And the last things are basically what I mentioned before, like have a process and do not forget there are other criteria. So interest, as we have seen before, is just one of them. And we also think about the other ones. Then we have defined our interest. We want to define how we want to weight the different type of interactions. So the SMC allows you to, to define a weighting for interactions. And this is also something which is part of the overall concept. And in the end, you would start by looking on the touch points and then uh, try to understand what touch points are important for you. And then, um, of course, depending on, on your brand and your sales channels, and then really start with a simple approach. Normally, I would say you start with your conversion targets. Uh, most of the time, it's a sales order and give the conversion targets a rating, not necessarily the highest rating, because if the sales order is already there, you're not sure if, if you need so much marketing on top, depending on the use case. Um, for coffee, that may be the case, for others not. And then we would start with the interactions that are part of the journey for, for sales or that could be the product views and things like that or events and try to make a comparison between the two or between the different um, parts of the journey and then test the model in the system. So since a few releases, it's possible to recalculate such a weighting and, and you get pretty fast results and you can instantly see it in the contact profile. And for that, I'm going to show you a quick demo which has been recorded. So let's have a look at one of the contact profiles which shows the interest level of the contact. In this example, you can see Diana Pinto. Um, she is having an interest level of 104 for coffee whole beans. And if we scroll down a little bit, we can see that she obviously ordered something related to coffee whole beans. So we see that she did a checkout, a successful checkout and created a sales order. And this mainly should be the main contributors for this interest level. So now let's change the weighting a little bit and see how this will change the interest level in the profile. Since a few releases, we are offering a new app called Define Interest Weighting. This app allows you to define how specific interactions influence the interest level in segmentation, in the contact profile, and in the account profile. This is done by evaluating the parameters you maintain in this app 
and then using this weighting factor for calculation. In this case, you can see the different business units, and I prepared a small example to, to give you an idea how that could look like for Galodoro. Um, in this case, you see that for the electronics business unit, I have a smaller weighting factor for the sales order than for the other business units. This is mainly because for a B2C electronics case, after the sales order, there's not much happening anymore. Galodoro sells high um, price products like espresso machines or pizza ovens. And normally, if someone buys such a product, he will not buy another one in the next few months or years. It's different if you look at coffee, of course, because coffee is something that you consume. And obviously, if you acquired or bought one coffee, uh, one item of coffee, you will also buy another one pretty soon for sure if you liked it. And now you can use this app to really play around with the values. So in this case, I would now say, look, the sales order weighting for coffee is way too low and I will increase it to 150 instead of 100. And then we will run the application job and check how the behavior changes in the profile. To recalculate the interest level, there's a specific application job which can be planned and scheduled also on a regular basis depending on your needs. To schedule it, go to the application marketing application shops, click on the create button and select the job template. And there's a specific job template called Apply waiting rules to existing interactions. Go to step two. Tell the system to start immediately because in this case, we want to really test our changes and want to get results pretty soon. Click on step three. Tell the system to go in a productive mode and to change all interactions. And then we click on schedule and the system will start to work. So let's have a look at the result of the calculation. When looking at the profile of Diana Pinto, we can see that the interest level for coffee whole beans increased to 154. And of course, this is mainly driven by the sales order she did a few days back, but also by other interactions, um, which we have seen before. And as you can see, this recalculation and adjusting of weighting gives you a good possibility to really try out new weighting factors and by doing so, continuously improving your interest level in this profile and also in the segmentation, of course. So um, this was just one example of applying the weighting and and of course, that waiting table you have seen is, um, was comparably easy. I guess if you're running a larger project, then this will have way more entries. Um, but I hope that you, you got the idea behind it. Um, the next step would be that you need to, to understand and configure your touch points. So touch point is where whenever you have a, let's say a data collection contact with, with one of the consumers. Um, and in the end, um, you need, again, have a look on, on the journey of the customer. You, you ideally, you know the entry points or the main entry points, and you know what you want to achieve. And you also see what could happen in between. So classically, this is what I have here on that slide. This is the impact we see is um, that emails have an impact, especially click-throughs. A landing page has an impact. A landing page submit especially has an impact. And then the commerce shop itself and, and how how the journey in the commerce shop may look like. Of course, this is, in the end, this is an, an open list. And what we see from our customer project is that you need to have priorities in place because most of the times we have quite a lot of touch points and looking at the project, you cannot just do it all at once. So really 
look on where you can we have the most impact and then try to make a priority list and tackle all of those touch points. For them, it's quite easy, I would say, because it's working out of the box. For others, where you perhaps have a third party integration and you need to enhance this integration a little bit. Um, but um, I guess as the data model is fairly uncomplex in that area because its interest is just flat. Um, it's something which can be managed. So for that, we also prepared a short demo for the landing page, which I'm going to show you because we see that the landing page is often one of the touch points um, where we, you have first contact um, with a customer. And so it also often makes sense to, to have this as a high priority. So let's have a look. So let's have a quick look at one of the most important touch points for our customers, the landing page. For Galodoro, we already have a pre-designed landing page, which looks quite nice. And as you can see in the preview of the landing page, we also offer the download of a sustainability report. This sustainability report is something where we really want to have that interest collected as well. To do so, we need to edit the form because the form is basically holding the logic of the landing page. And we're just clicking here in that block where the form is located and see that the form is this form mentioned here. So let's see how we can change the behavior of that form. We open up the form go into edit mode and just look for that checkbox here. This is the checkbox which is triggering the request to have a sustainability report. And we just select the item of interest within the data mapping section. And we click on save. Now, Whenever a customer ticks off this checkbox, we write an interaction which also includes that interest sustainability. So now this is the landing page which has been published. And now I'm entering my name here and my email address. And I request a sustainability report and confirm. Takes a moment. So when we look at the data created, we see that there's a new profile on my name, basically, which has an interest level of one for sustainability. And you can also see that I post a download request on that landing page. And this is then resulting in a sustainability interest level of one. We only have one because there's no waiting defined for that specific interaction type. So landing page is of course just one of the many touch points. And then as we then would have the data in the system, it's time to, to think about and look how we can work with a segmentation. Um, and I specifically brought up this building block topic here because I believe that helps a lot for them to the, for the marketeers to simplify things. Um, so whereas our segmentation engine is quite powerful, um, this, this power also increases complexity from time to time. And though we would, I believe building blocks are quite a good mean to, to reduce complexity a little bit. Um, so first thing, and this is always the case for segmentation, is you need to think about your scenarios. And, and in the end, you need to know what kind of campaigns you want to run. You want to know what kind of targets and goals you want to achieve. And then based on that, you define the criteria you want to have for segmentation. So the referencing to the slide we had before, and then, and then we see that all quite often on customer side, there are quite great ideas for, for complex segmentation. And then 
you need to check the availability of data because you cannot segment on a gender if you don't collect the data. So let's see, let's say the easy example here. Um, and parts of it is, is what we discussed with the touch point before. Um, but of course, it could also result in, in adjustments you need to make to your touch points. So you, if you have a specific scenario which you want to have using your uh, commerce data or data coming from the commerce shop, and you probably need to extend the data you collect, for example, if you don't have it. And based on that, you can then set up those building blocks. And this setup, I believe that should be done together with the marketeers. And then you could also run a campaign to verify the uh, setup. And I guess it's also important to make sure that those building blocks are named as precise as possible. And the funny thing is that even when preparing this demo, I created some, uh, some building blocks. And then after two days, I also was not sure anymore what's inside, just because uh, my my naming was not precise enough. So it really is uh, a good investment to really think about how you name it, because it doesn't help if you have some kind of building block templates available, and then the marketeer has a different understanding. And I also want to quickly show you how the building blocks look like. So let's have a quick look how you can use building blocks to simplify life of marketeers when using more complex simple segmentation. So in this case, I already prepared a building block, which is basically looking on the top 10% of contacts having sustainability interest in the last year. And you can see we have the full contact base here on top. And if I go to change segment, you can see I went to the comparison operator top N, 10%, made a condition of uh, dynamic last year. So basically from the day of today, it will calculate one year back and for the item of interest sustainability. And we then will calculate the interest level for that and take the top 10 contacts. Um, this interest level is equal to the one in the contact profile, so it's also easy to, to compare. Um, now, looking at the capabilities of the building blocks, I would now save this building block, and with this little button, I publish it. And after publishing, I can also set the define the usage of that building block. In our case, I want to send it to reference. That means whenever this building block is used in a regular segmentation, we are not copying it, but we're making a reference on that building block, and we then can also centrally change that building block. So if you have defined a certain audience, in this case on that interest level, you can centrally change this building block for all existing segmentation models using this building block, which makes it quite easy to adjust your targeting, even if you have many segmentation models already created. So let's have a look on how we can use those building blocks. So I opened up a new segmentation model, and here in the top left corner, you can see our public building blocks. We have now three of them, one uh, regarding Arabica beans and then another one regarding revenue in the last six months. So this is also possible to, to have calculated figures used here. And I now will just drag the sustainability interest which has created into that segmentation model. And I want to combine those two and also drag the Arabica one. And now I want to have the contacts which are in both of the segment trees. And this can be easily done by just drag and dropping and making an intersect. And I now end up having 88 people being in this segmentation. So I narrowed down pretty much that segmentation. And of course, now you can add additional criteria as well, like country or other criteria. 
And of course, for these other criteria, you can also create building blocks. So ideally, you set up your platform in a way that the marketeer just needs to do some drag and drop and can then fine tune really on attribute level for even more details. So I hope that gave you an insight on the use of building blocks. And from the presentation side, we're already coming to an end. And just to give you a short summary um, on what we learned and, and what we learned from our customers. So just four things I would say. So simple is the best place to start. Um, this is something I personally cannot repeat uh, more often because um, sometimes um, customers of an, an approaching environment, there's a high pressure and then uh, there's a tendency to, to work on complex stuff, but often it is more, way more makes way more sense to really look on the on the quick wins and and really start with the simple things and that also in the second item here you see it's pretty similar this is not just start with simple but also start with single so basically shall we focus on one use case get this use case done and and learn from it and then you will see that um, if that is working good then the complexity will anyway increase automatically and then, I guess I mentioned it before, uh, even though that marketing is, is often pretty much KPI driven and numbers are important and, and they stay important, of course, but sometimes it really makes sense to, to involve experienced marketeers. So I've seen the really project where, where um, experienced marketeer really could make a difference because they have developed a good intuition for their customer base and they, they sometimes they f they really feel what is potentially could work and what does not work, and I believe it makes really sense to listen to those people. And then the last thing, and then I mentioned it before as well, interest is not the uh, solution for everything, so it's not the the single criteria you should use, um, but also look on the other criteria. Um, this talking about them would just be enough or uh, too much for that one single webcast, but really make sure to have a broad picture on your data and to try to make use of your data to get the things right. So that's my input basically. And then we can really jump into the Q and A. And I have seen that there are already some questions in that, at least also in that Q and A area here. Let me, let me have a look. So one is about uh, assigning multiple interests per interaction. And this honestly is something I don't 100% get because this is already possible. So you can already assign multiple interests to, to one interaction. The only issue we have and we are aware of it is that in some areas of the product, this is not reflected. Um, we know that this is not reflected in Content Studio, and this is something which uh, colleagues are looking into. But in general, it's possible to to have multiple uh, interests, and this also uh, in the in this mapping um, I showed. If you if you could have a sales order, for example, with multiple products or product categories, you could also end up having multiple interests on the interaction level. So this is already supported. Not sure if this answers your question. And then there's one question about targeting the ones with the, with um, getting the highest interest or this, I guess the question is from, from Bradley. It's the question is uh, to understand which is the highest interest of a single contact. Um, that's a fair question. This currently, is not possible out of the box with, with the interest level, but we are looking into that um, because we understand that uh, it, it is um, also one of the segmentation requests is that you want to segment on 
all the contacts where the the main interest of a contact, I would call it like that, is a specific one. This is something that we're looking into. I hope this, this answered your, your question. Let's see if there are more. The interest level segmentation field, there's one question. Um, this is, as far as I know, and perhaps I need to lie a bit, I'm not sure, but it is, uh, it is available in the standard segmentation objects. And if you don't see it, you need to toggle the visibility of it. But it is available in standard. Perhaps it is um, delivered as a hidden field. That could be the case because that's something we we do quite often. So that's something you could check. But if you don't find it, um, really just drop me an email. I can have a look. Are there any more questions around this topic? So this is my email address. You can see it here. Um, and yeah, feel free to drop an email if you have a question around the topic. So if there are no more questions, I would say, thanks a lot. Thanks for participating.